So 12% of America is now fully vaccinated. Millions more will qualify this week as the states begin to expand uh, eligibility criteria. But it's obviously a different story for billions of others around the world. Can you expand a little more on the, the disparity here? Well, you know, for instance, uh, the, the, the workhorse so far for the United States has been the two mRNA vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna, and they're great vaccines. And I, I, I received the uh, Pfizer uh, BioNTech vaccine, and, and I know now I'm not going to go to the hospital or the intensive care unit, and there's even evidence that could slow transmission. That's the good news. The not so good news, it's a brand new technology. Uh, it's difficult to scale production. It really has a pretty onerous freezer chain requirement. And while Pfizer BioNTech is willing to provide 230,000 doses to Rwanda, for instance, let's look at the scale of this. Uh, the Sub-Saharan Africa has a population of 1.1 billion people. We're assuming most of the vaccines are two doses. We're going to need two, two billion doses of COVID-19 vaccines to meet the needs of Sub-Saharan Africa. Who's going to produce that? It's not going to be uh, those two mRNA vaccines. And so the, and even though there was a well-intentioned effort by the policymakers to ensure equity, the truth is the vaccines aren't there. So hopefully the uh, adenovirus vaccine uh, from AstraZeneca Oxford will play some role, maybe the J&J one, but even then, uh, it, there, for reasons that we can go into, it, that, that may not be adequate. So a vaccine like ours, which is an older technology, I think would be a very welcome addition uh, to that for Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. In other words, uh, a, a vaccine specifically designed for resource-poor settings. There was some initial pushback, though, to distributing a low-cost vaccine to low- and middle-income countries, and that pushback came from richer nations like the U.S., and the European Union. You write, the fact that no new vaccines are made in Africa or in many other low and middle income countries reflects profound lapses in international science cooperation and diplomacy between wealthy and poor nations. This will soon have catastrophic consequences. Tell us a bit more about what you mean by those lapses in cooperation and diplomacy between the poor and the wealthy nations. We hear a lot these days about vaccine nationalism, uh, which I imagine plays into the dynamic you're describing at least a bit. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So, you know, the, the multinational pharmaceutical companies, uh, you, you know, they, it's not that they've, they've ignored the world's low and middle income countries, but for new vaccines that could be specifically designed for the needs of low and middle income countries, that's not the priority of the multinational companies. And the point of, of the op-ed was to say, you know, it's now time to build capacity in places like Africa or to expand it in Latin America or the Middle East so they can make their own vaccines, not only for pandemic threats like COVID-19, but also for important diseases of regional importance. And, and many people are astonished to learn that no new vaccines are made on the African continent. Uh, and, and we need to build that capacity in order to respond to emergencies rather than this dependence on the multinationals and, and the hope that something filters down to the resource poor countries. That, that's not a recipe for success in fighting these global pandemics and, and for diseases that are diseases of regional importance in Africa, like as was mentioned, female genital schistosomiasis or brutally ulcer. The multinationals are never going to produce those vaccines for, for sub-Saharan Africa.